But I'm going to ask the first one. Can somebody please, one of you please stand up, not all of you, and just remind me about what SA 1, 2, 3, and 4 are, how big they are. Can you go back? No, 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 I won't press that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go over there, mainly. I'll go over there. Okay, so SA ones. Here we go. Uh, uh, our really our smallest unit. Oh, well, we've got a hem one. Okay, so SA1s are really our smallest unit of geography for which we produce statistics for. There's some very limited data available for mesh blocks, but it's usually only population and dwelling counts. So SA1s are between 200 and 800 dwellings. I'm looking at Richard. Uh, so there's about uh, 54,000 of them in Australia. So there's, they're quite a small unit. They're, they're sort of, they're below a suburb, I guess. Um, so a quite small, you know, area, especially in urban, urban areas. In, in regional areas, they can be bigger, obviously, to, to make sure we get enough population in them to, to make sure um, the information we produce is not um, needed to be confidentialised to a point where it's useless. Mm -hmm. So SA2s are the next level up. They're aggregations of SA1s, so we build a couple of SA1s together to, to build these SA2s. Um, so they're, uh, they're between 3,000 and 25,000 people. So that's a slightly larger unit. Um, it, it's the unit we generally produce our population estimates for in, in, in between censuses because we can get the right information for that larger area to make those um, estimates meaningful. And then the areas build up from there, SA3, SA4, in terms of larger and larger areas. The SA4s are designed really for release of our labour force survey data because we have to have enough sample in them to produce reliable estimates for those SA4s. Does that answer to your question? Does that answer your question? <laughs> Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Okay. Uh, oh, we need the microphone back. Janine, chase that mic. Questions, comments? Gentleman here in a white shirt. Ian Appleby from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. I think this is a question for Paul. Um, I agree with Louise that there's a question around if we do use the modified Monash, how we might aggregate the data. Clearly, uh, some of those levels have very small populations in them, and when you're looking at particular groups of service users, you'll be talking about very small groups indeed. Um, are there any no-nos about grouping uh, particular levels? Are there any unintended consequences that we need to watch out for? Do you have any uh, particular advice about how we might group things up? Um, to be honest, we haven't put a lot of thought into what the groupings might be. Um, I did have one floating in the back of my head where I wanted to um, put some naming conventions on it, but it's uh, um, not allowed by the executive, and so we're stuck with MM1 to MM7. I, I don't think my names are very good. Um, <laughs> but I think um, after looking at... I mean, when you do these sort of breakups, you're trying to aim for something that's going to be meaningful and the uh, area's useful enough. Um, the thought I have in the back of my mind, and I think in some ways we maybe need to have a bigger discussion with the interested parties around it. Um, we can also sort of often wait to see how statistics play out. But I do suspect to a certain extent that we're going to find MM1 and MM2 um, reported separately because MM2, big enough population, um, and it's also quite a large range of population, 50,000 plus encompasses really everything from 50,000 to uh, 250,000, which is when you fall into RA1. And if you think about that, and then um, when you think five at the other end, are all those small areas which are very widely distributed, I tend to think of them in the same way as I do six and seven. And so where we may end up being is an MM1, MM2, MM3, 4 combined, MM5, 6, 7 combined. Um, and we already combine 6, 7 quite often. Um, 
which is RA4 and 5, and you'll find a lot of statistics do that because the populations there are quite small. And so including 5 in that um, really notes that the issues that they face are similar, and it'll also give a little bit more heft to the 5, 6, 7 uh, categories. So short answer is we haven't got anything formal yet, but um, we, you know, it's something that we wouldn't mind seeing. Thanks, Paul. Just to, to, to make things m uh, move more smoothly so we don't waste too much time, uh, when the, the answer is being uh, provided by one of our panelists, if you want to ask the next question, please raise your hand so Janine might find you. Who's next? Back at the back, Janine, thanks. Carolyn Coleman, Department of Health. I have a very dumb question, probably for the ADS people. Um, the Commonwealth Government has a deregulation agenda, and you speak of using administrative data, but all over Australia, administrators are instructed to collect less data. So how does that impact on the collection of administrative data? Sorry, Louise. Um, good question. Uh, I guess that, that's exactly right, and I think David alluded to it in his um, talk, that administrative data is not collected for the purposes of statistical um, output in any way. It's, it's usually collected for, for billing or cost, uh, whatever. Um, so I think that's something that we just have to address um, in, in our analysis and how we can use the data. I don't... From the Institute's point of view, we use a very large amount of administrative data. And Australia at the moment is, is caught in this crossroads between big data, collect once, use many times, um, and making sure that we maintain privacy. Uh, so as administrative data drops off, um, obviously we'll have uh, issues with things that we couldn't an analyse before we no longer can. But there's also lots of new data coming online and lots of new ways that we can access and analyse the, those data. So for example, computing power has made things which before were just not possible, much more possible. So it's an ever moving feast. Um, obviously from the Institute's point of view, uh, more data is better, um, but we will, we will survive and we will find ways of, of doing things as some data sources drop off. We'll obviously have to look broader and find other ones. Thank you, David. Just here. Sorry. Well, not oh, Andrew, I'm sorry. Yep, sorry. Um, oh. I'll stand up. Um, uh, look, I, th I think maybe, maybe governments and administrators should reconsider and collect more data. If you want to know how your programs are going, especially in rural remote areas, some of these smaller population centres, I think it's absolutely critical that's more reflected. Now, it's obviously a cost consideration, but... Um, I think it's it's a really important thing to know what's going on statistically with you know, what what business you're doing. Yeah, you know. So you see, it uh, wasn't a dumb question at all. It was a question which allowed us to provide us a nuanced political response, which is very useful. <laughs> just just down the front here. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> uh, I'm Sharif Bagni, although I work with the New South Wales Rural Doctors Network. Uh, which is a rural workforce agency in, in New South Wales, and there's one in every state in Northern Territory. Um, we in, at RDN manage a range of outreach programs. You might know the ROF, and, and uh, that used to be called MSOAP and other outreach programs. And uh, I suppose m my, my comment is more of a comment rather than a question, but please do respond if you, if you think you can help. Um, uh, I suppose the, the comment is just to, for policymakers in the department and elsewhere, to use modified Monash, Monash and any other uh, population-based or distance-based classification with caution, uh, particularly when it's um, being applied to any particular program that limits or otherwise affects the conditions of whether something can be funded. Um, and I'll give an example of the remoteness classification, the ASGC RA, um, being quite detrimental in our ability to respond to rural communities' needs. Um, the three barriers that we're looking at typically when we're addressing the needs of an Aboriginal community in a remote or urban area 
is uh, not only distance and population based, but it really is around uh, economic barriers and also access uh, to culturally sp uh, suitable uh, services. Uh, no, and um, I suppose we've we've looked at these things quite quite a lot. Those the other two barriers are, are as great a barrier for the Aboriginal community as is a remote a distance barrier, um, and. Uh, there seems to be very little or no correlation at all uh, between distance and population uh, and the needs of a, of a community that might have um, a cultural need or there's very low socioeconomic levels in that community. So the availability of bulk build or free services or cultural specific, culturally developed services um, doesn't really relate to distance and that's uh, limited our ability to respond some to some communities. In fact, we w haven't been able to put services in some areas that would need them because they don't fall within a particular category. Um, so I suppose to policymakers in general, um, what, what is, how, how is this model going to be used in those types of programs? Um, I'll say that first of all, um, if, well, there's a few things I'll say in response and I, I fully understand the situation you're in and um, Certainly when we look around in my particular area, when I say I want to get rid of Rama, is because we do actually have it sitting on a number of programs, which I'm fairly sure blocks some things that people would want to do, but it's, you know, never, um, another option hasn't been found yet. And it's something that I'm conscious of, and I can tell you that the department's conscious of, of wanting to shift it because it's an unnecessary um, barrier. Another thing I'll say with regards to the use of these classifications and something I try and throw more and more um, alerts up to is that they only go so far. Um, you can find places like Margaret Valley in Western Australia. It's MM4, but a very nice place to live compared to some other MM4 places um, or MM3 like Broken Hill. It, it's not a solution and there is a sort of, and there's an understanding of that, and we are trying to look more at how we can design programs so that um, it can be a guiding usage, but not actually a constraining one, um, and allow for special circumstances. And the situation you're talking about, um, you know, I don't want to talk too much about it because it's not actually in my area, the way the, um, the ROF and those sort of programs are operating. But what I can say is that the sort of things that um, we would like to see in when we're talking about our service outreach and innovative solutions is both to allow those to happen, um, to use the data we have available to make sure that things are targeted in a way that where actual need exists. And when you start heading down that pathway, um, you do s often see some really quite unusual effects. And what I always refer to is um, people in lower CIF areas tend to have a much higher GP usage. And so if you start linking how many resources do you need by CIF area, there's actually an inclination, you know, to get equality to take the services off them. And, you know, we know why they're using it. They're using an alternative as using special services because their health outcomes are worse. And it's that sort of awareness that you need to take when we, we start looking at what is an area of need. And I guess in the end is that um, I think you'll see as time goes on a more sort of um, policies built around sort of ways of looking at areas to prioritize but using local information to actually decide the final result. So how quickly that will happen or I, c I can't really say and whether it will happen with the ROF in any time soon I also can't say but you know we are conscious of it. And I think the sort of a time and a period we went through of the um, economic rationalist, you know, using figures and just basing policies on those is fading away a bit and we're allowing the flexibility and the awareness of um, and the local knowledge to feed into how services can be delivered and help provided. Does that... I don't have Andrew's uh, <coughs> subtle nuanced approach, uh, but I will observe that where uh, doctors, nurses, not nurses, where doctors, pharmacists, and dentists are concerned, there is a strong view that Australia, in terms of aggregate national averages, has enough 
and what we have is a distribution problem. And the question, of course, reminds us that the distribution, the maldistribution is not only in respect of health need, but also in respect of cultural appropriateness. So I think it's something for us to remember. Uh, the question, gentleman with the white shirt. Oh, oh, it's over there. There it is. Hi, I'm Christine Roach from New South Wales Rural Doctors Network, and my question is for Paul. Um, I work in the area of general practice recruitment and retention, and there's a few of my colleagues from the other states here as well. Our um, question is around the uh, um, application of um, modified Monash to the Rural Locum Relief Program, um, which is currently still using the old Rama classification for its eligibility. So has the department considered other programs, and is the Rural Locum Relief Program on that agenda? Here I can happily say this is precisely my area and when I talk about killing Rama, that is one of the main things I'm thinking of. <laughs> um, yes, it is on our agenda. Um, when we look at the comparison between Rama and RA, let alone Rama and Modified Monash, we can see some significant issues. A lot of that is simply because the um, Rama data hasn't been updated because there always is a sort of background intention to move away from it rather than updating it. Um, and on the flip side, um, as I was saying before, the way the Rama was constructed is not the way we would approach it today. Um, and I would say that um, speaking a little more, and, and really I think there's a few more things happening around um, rural workforce agency funding at the moment, particularly with um, agreements ending in the uh, middle of next year. and looking to move to the next range of long-term funding so that we want to do everything at once. So yes, we do want to um, change that, but we'll probably do it as a package rather than a piecemeal process. Um, and just in general, um, when the modified Monash was originally announced, we had a few people who queried us, then we put it on the web and no one talked to us again. And so every now and then I'm asked to do presentations within the department to different areas on the modified Monash. Um, but I really don't have a view as to who's seriously considering it. And budget processes being what they are, we tend not to discuss <coughs> um, those um, changes unless there's a definite need to. And the fact is the department's now filling up with a lot of um, good modelers and good um, geospatial analysts and uh, they don't specifically need me to take part in um, doing the modeling and work around it. But having said all of that, I think um, the general thought is is that when a program sort of runs to the end of its uh, funding, when they're talking about what the next agreement will look like, that's when people are saying, well, does Modified Monash fit into what we're trying to do? And as we saw with the IPA presentation, sometimes it just doesn't. Sometimes this RA is good enough and sometimes you just want to leave it as RA 2 to 5. Um, but, you know, that's something that each policy area will have to consider um, as the time for renewing their agreements come up. Thank you, Paul. Janine, where are we? Here we are. Gentleman in the white shirt. Uh, Ian Appleby, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare again. Uh, Sarah, if I could ask you a question. First of all, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. Uh, it was very informative and, and very interesting from the point of view of, I guess, taking a little bit of the gloss off uh, the modified Monash model. Um, now, my understanding of what you were saying was particularly with regard to the national efficient cost uh, approach, that uh, the loadings uh, don't seem to be improved by using modified Monash. Um, and it sounds like, you know, at, at best, um, it's equivocal. So it sounds to me like you're saying that for the time being you're sticking with the remoteness area uh, classification. Now I guess I'm interested in what the future holds, whether you're considering alternatives, whether you're planning to stay with RA for the long term, and whether you've looked at things like uh, CIFA um, and other ways of measuring need uh, in particular areas that have uh, rural and remote hospitals. Hello, testing. Um, so um, we have tested 
sort of to answer the second part of your question first, um, every year CFA is something that we consider in the development of the NEP and the NEC. Um, and it seems that um, the Indigenous and the remoteness loadings that we use account for the majority of the variation that's seen in CFA. Um, so adding that in would sort of... Most of that variation is taken care of by the variables we already use. Um, I guess at IPA we're always um, sort of being pulled by two different forces. One of those is um, wanting to provide a certain level of stability for the states and territories in terms of Commonwealth funding, but then also wanting to innovate and looking at new remoteness classifications like Modified Monash. So it's def Modified Monash isn't off the table. I'm not saying that we're going to stick with RA indefinitely. I mean, every year um, there's a very, um, very in-depth um, consultation process with a range of stakeholders, including the states and territories. And if we get um, responses to the NEP and the NEC um, that say, you know, we want you to look into this again, we're happy to do it. Um, because, I mean, we revise it every year with new cost and activity data. So it's definitely not off the table. It's more a case of um, RA is good enough at the moment and we'd need to see, um, you know, a fairly big um, payoff um, in order to change to a different classification. Uh, allow me just to observe that obviously for rural people, people in rural remote areas, the fact that there is a separate algorithm for small hospitals is a critically important uh, principle and one which we, the National Rural Health Alliance, have supported very strongly because if small hospitals were to be exclusively activity-based funded, then there will be serious repercussions for the existence of those small hospitals. So I just want to put on the record that the principle of the two is very, very important to the Rural Health Alliance and to rural people. Where's the microphone, Janine? About this. Thank you. I'm Danielle Taylor from the Australian Population and Migration Research Centre um, at the University of Adelaide. My group was formerly known as JISCA and we were involved in a lot of the work um, producing ARIA. And I just wanted to clarify a few points about RA um, and about ARIA that came um, before. So um, RA is the ABS classification of ARIA+. Plus. Um, it is a necessarily crude classification, five classes. ARIA Plus is a continuous index from 0 to 15 and it covers every square kilometre of the country. Um, so it can be aggregated to any spatial unit. It isn't bounded by administrative units that we had that discussion about prior. Also, I guess when we developed ARIA, it was a purely geographic measure of remoteness and um, it was always acknowledged that social and cultural factors should be considered to um, develop a complete idea about what is true accessibility. So I think the points that have been raised are really important to reiterate that um, <coughs> geographic remoteness alone isn't um, everything that should be considered in a funding model. Um, I guess the other um, point that I'd like to make is, I guess I, as a geographer, I have a little bit of a concern about um, our lack of geography around <coughs> functional service centres. Um, so I guess Paul has tried to address this with the, the buffering of the larger towns to capture those satellite towns. But the one area that I think we may be missing is where you've got a grouping of small towns where their collective population perhaps pushes them up above a population threshold for the Monash, modified Monash. Um, they're actually slipping through. My example is the Barossa Valley. So Tanunda, Angaston and Nuriukpa are all a modified Monash 5, which um, would, in, in that broader classification and grouping that Paul would have them grouped in, would put them up with Alice Springs and everywhere else super remote. Um, and I, I question if that's perhaps the, the, you know, that needs, that aspect of the model perhaps needs to be focused on a little bit more. Thank you for that. Do you want to comment? Anybody? Paul? Danielle, in many ways, um, and pretty much about it being a um, remoteness classification, a geographical one for RA in particular. Um, when it comes to the sort of issue of grouping towns up, 
um, again, a valid one. And one thing is when we're talking about that group of five, six, seven as being po one possible larger group, you do have to take it in mind as, you know, if you're actually delivering a program, not such a great option because some of these five areas are outside the 20 kilometer buffer zone of a major city. So when you do want to group it up by, you know, as a five, six, seven area, while I do think it's, um, they do tend to be small areas that won't support an usual business model, need different ways of handling it as per remote areas. They still do face different conditions. But the one thing um, I really want to support with Danielle saying is that whole idea of having an index of need and um, remoteness is only one aspect and we use it as a proxy just as RA. I think if you use modified Monash, we already have found areas where, as I was saying with Margaret River, where um, it's not telling the whole story. And I think to a certain extent, um, I'm hoping that over time, Australia's data collections will become more mature to allow us to do that. And one of the key aspects we have is the health outcome data is very sparse in Australia from almost any source. I think ABS has the best collection from with the Australian Health Survey. And I know we as a department suggested putting on long-term health conditions into the census, which might improve it again. But really, until we get some, some way of seeing what the actual outcome is from the services people are using and why they're using those services, um, we're always going to be stuck in proxies. And, um, and similarly for things like service centers and, um, <coughs> oh, I was gonna say, the fact that we're using town size as a proxy for the range of services it provides, which may be good at a rough level, um, will always fall th through if you look around hard enough. So again, it gets to something I was saying earlier, which is, it's better to use these things with a little bit of a, um, as a prioritization tool, but to put a little common sense at the end of it where you can. And I think the only times we're too harsh with it is um, when we're actually paying dollars on it, in which case we just stick to one limit and um, get people writing letters to the minister about it. Um, Louis, so Louis, yeah, thank you. Louise, do you want to comment? Maybe not? Martin. A, and it sort of reflects on what Paul was saying is, oh sorry, there is, a, um, there is certainly a move in Australia to better uh, represent the placement of services within the landscape, so the location within towns and cities particularly. Um, however, that information is incomplete and there's not a lot of resources going into it. So um, there is some work going in into that space and it will get better with time. The other thing, though, I would, I would also ask a question about is just because somewhere already has uh, a service, does that mean that it should be excluded from having additional services, so, for example, a GP service, et cetera? So it's got to be very carefully balanced against the, 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 the ability to have diversity and, and also meet a variety of needs within a population. You know, we talked about travel time before with what AHW is doing, but the travel time work often assumes you access the cl closest service where I certainly know I drive past dozens of GP clinics to go to the one I want to go to. So, you know, it's a very complex uh, algorithm that you would need to put together to understand that um, in, in a mathematical sense. Thanks, Mike. Matthew, grab a mic, grab a mic. Uh, no, grab, grab that one. Okay. Um, Sorry, I haven't spoken yet. So, yeah, Matthew McGrath, I'm, I'm with Monash University School of Rural Health, uh, one of the original architects. Uh, really exciting to be here and seeing this uh, sort of, I guess, five, six years down the track from where we started. Um, a couple of comments, just just listening and, and, and sort of hearing what, yeah, what, what, what everyone's saying. Um, I guess the Monash model was always intended to be, uh, you yeah, a simple applications, you know, with uh, you know finite number of categories. Uh, you know, Danielle raised the idea of a, you know a scale can be much more finite in terms of the the score that kind of sits behind that. Uh, again, you know, the Monash model could 
take that approach, but uh, it was always intentionally uh, uh, meant to be a, a simple uh, or simple to apply scale. So, um, and, and, and it could be broken down into kind of all the different uh, components that you know uh, sort of sit behind or underpin it. Um, so, absolutely agree. I mean, some of the comments here about uh, you know it's not necessarily just about population size. Sometimes it'd be nice to break that down into the different components. Was highly conscious of that when we were developing it, but we were always thinking about you know, potential policy application at kind of the broad level, easy to apply, but there's always a place for that uh, finer uh, breakdown. So that's, that's one aspect. Uh, and just this, the second aspect I wanted to touch on was uh, sort of the other side of what I do with uh, what I see that you're, I'm, I'm with the Centre of Research Excellence in Rural and Remote Primary Healthcare, and one of the key uh, components that we've been working on over the last, last four or five years is uh, actually an index of access. So this is a national level model. And so when we talk about access, uh, with, uh, you know, we're bringing together the components of uh, availability, proximity and also health needs. So trying to bring these together into um, you know, a scale or a score. So a more sophisticated approach that brings in you know, the different components of all of this. Uh, you know, it was uh, the IHW mentioned that their uh, Indigenous um, report um, th that actually used some of the methods that we've been that, that, that I was actually behind developing with that. So again, another uh, nice to see sort of the work that we've you know, built on uh, being applied at kind of national level policy and development. Um, so I guess I don't have much more to say about that other than you know there is work happening. Uh, we are working on kind of you know more sophisticated approaches to this, uh, thinking about trying to develop you know these national uh, level ind indices that that uh, bring in the, the different components, whether it's need or or access and all the different uh, dimensions or aspects that really uh, mean access, uh, and they can mean uh, different things in different contexts, whether you're talking about in indigenous access or whether it's some other uh, subgroup, I guess. So just kind of uh, making people aware of kind of the, there there are other um, uh, I guess bodies of work that are happening in this mm. in this field and, and trying to trying to improve things. Thank you, Matthew. So the work continues. The work's not finished. Yeah. Now I'm I'm very 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 pleased with this next question. I don't know what it's about, but I I do know that Ethne has the most wonderful accent. So I hope it's, I hope it's a very long question. <laughs> oh, you've really put me on the spot, Gordon. Um, I'm Ethna Irving from the Australian Dental Association, <laughs> and I'm embarrassed now. So anyway, um, I want to bring it back to workforce issues because we're one of those um, health professional groups that think there's enough dentists now, and that there may be some tweaking that needs to be done in terms of distribution, but um, that's we're working through that, those issues. Um, Currently, um, a lot of the workforce studies are based on the labour force survey data that comes in and then AIHW produce those reports and they categorise po the health po practitioner population by RA. So that information is being used to say there are shortages in these areas because the ratio of, of dentists, for example, to, po to the population is pretty low in some areas. But as we know, you know, we've said before and I think Ma Paul knows it, you need a minimum number of people to, in order to have a health professional who's, who's paid on a fee-for-service rebate. Now, the modified Monash will, um, we know is going to be used in the DRIS scheme from next year, which is the Dental Relocation Scheme. I'm hoping that you are going to have access to more recent data to be able to determine where the dental workforce needs to go and that you're not going to rely on that labour force survey data, which is already out of date before you, anyone gets it and is based on a you know people voluntarily telling you where they're practicing so is your is your plan Paul to have access to the data set the national health workforce data set which is more current and real time and was that long enough Gordon thanks Again, a bit of a tough question which um, lies partly around my sphere, although I have talked with you um, around some of these aspects on the um, around dental stuff. And last week I was at the actual um, uh, uh, research forum put together by RHWA on dental workforce. 
And um, I was giving a similar presentation to the one I gave here, and um, as I was going down, I was thinking, well, wait a sec, I haven't actually broken down dentist by modified Monash yet. And so I sent a um, staff member to go and try and do that before I talked at 11, and he didn't email me till 11.30, so <laughs> just missed out. But um, what I can say is, yes, we are inevitably bound by the data we have available to us. Um, what we are able to get our hands on and this applies to all health workforce professions. Um, I'll note that there is the MBS data for some people who have Medicare provider numbers because they can claim when a GP refers a patient to them, they can um, claim for the service through Medicare, um, but that's not complete. And moreover, the activity on that uh, Medicare provider number that your dentist or a um, physiotherapist might be doing um, won't reflect all their activity. So we are restricted to both, when you register, you do have to place, put down a um, address for your place of um, business. And associated with that registration is a labor force survey, which is where you then say I'm, a, whether, I'm work whether you're working or not and how long you're working for. And we don't have any other national data set on where the allied health professionals are, including dentists. Um, one thing we're doing within the department since HWA came under our wing is um, working with that data because that used to be something that um, HWA managed and produced their workforce estimations on. Um, we are looking at how that data comes in and trying to get the data out quicker. And in that sort of sense, it means that we want to have that sort of dent um, the registration and whether they are actually actively working, sort of put in front of our modeling as soon as possible. But even with MBS data, where we get monthly feeds, it generally takes sort of six months before that data is in the shape after cleansing and um, geocoding and doing all the other steps you do with it, six months before it becomes useful. And I think the same is going to be with allied health data that when someone makes an application through DRIS, I don't think we'll ever be in a position to um, say off one data set exactly how many people are there. Um, so that is a reality we work with and this gets again to what I was saying before about trying to place too much on just pure data and numbers. That you always need to have some sort of um, component built into a program, especially grant ones where you have a prioritization method some component where someone sits down and actually says, you know, are the numbers that we see here making sense? Um, so having said all of that, I can't answer your question directly as to um, how applications will be treated by the RHWA. Um, even if we could supply RHWA with more uh, where dentists are, it's never going to be perfect because of both when we get the data and when we'll be able to send it on with confidentiality our requirements, it's a question of even how much we can send on. Um, what I can say is the interesting thing I saw with the MMM with dentists is that it, um, MM5, those towns less than 5,000 people, had almost a third of the number of dentists, um, you know, on a population base than the rest of um, the rest of sort of MM1 to 4. And when you look at that sort of thing, it again it sort of calls into attention that, you know, these places don't have enough to actually support a dentist. It shows up in the figures. And if we want dentists to actually be working in that area, our solution isn't going to be relocating a dentist and trying to get them to set up a full-time business plan there. It's going to have to be something, you know, a little more out of the box, a little more um, thinking about alternative methods and um, how we can promote those and how we can get those going. And those thoughts are in our mind, albeit that um, there's many, many layers between us analysts and where it actually gets approved by the minister. So does that sort of give you where we stand? Yeah. Louise. 
So apologies if you already know this, but I just wanted to tell you, um, in case you aren't aware, that the ABS also runs a patient experience survey. And as part of that survey, it collects information on barriers to access, including um, GPs, dentists, um, and a range of medical specialists and other things. Um, and so that, I guess, correlates a little bit with what um, Paul was saying in terms of indications of how many people are, are going to the dentist um, by the remoteness, because I haven't done it by modified Monash, um, and also the barriers. And I guess that's another source of information that might inform mm. the debate generally. Or oral health is uh, an issue of great importance to the National Rural Health Alliance for obvious reasons, because it's so, so seriously bad in rural remote areas. Um, both the National Rural Health Alliance, for which I work, and the ADA are associated with an organization called the National Oral Health Alliance, which has a website. So if you want to follow developments, uh, you can go to the National Oral Health Alliance website. Thank you, over here. Hi, thank you. My name's Tonya De Bruin, and I'm from Darling Downs HHS in Queensland. Um, Sarah, I think my question's directed at you. Um, I'm new to the clinical side of health, only having been in it for 18 months, so forgive my ignorance in many spaces. With the national efficient costing in rural and remote areas, how do you take into account utilisation from a perspective, um, uh, perspective rather than the retro perspective of having been to a, a, a doctor or having been to a hospital um, in terms of all of the people that aren't seeking the care that they actually need um, and therefore aren't necessarily being picked up in your figures in terms of the hospital utilisation and to what extent are you engaged in the conversations about the index of need that has been discussed because I think that that's something that seems to be missing in rural and remote areas? Thanks for the question. Um, I guess, um, so IPA as an organisation is legislated to um, allocate Commonwealth funding to public hospitals, whether they be metro or rural and remote, um, depending on the services that they provide. So that's kind of the scope of like the basis from which um, IPA allocates funding. Um, so I think there is a bit of a disconnect between, because we're only measuring what is being utilised. Um, so I'm not going to pretend that um, we do look into things like that. Um, I mean, of course it's a concern, um, but I don't think it's within the scope of um, IPA's functions at the moment. ensuring people get the right care at the right time rather than the only care at the last minute. So the, the follow-up question then is uh, who is responsible, who owns the issue of people living in areas where there's not sufficient primary care ending up in acute care facilities? And the funding for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm not I mean, I, we cover hospital services, and as part of um, how we fund things, we are trying to um, incentivise hospitals being more efficient. So if there are areas where primary health services aren't being utilised properly and um, people are ending up in hospital for things that could have been prevented, it will show up as a much higher cost. So those hospitals would not be as efficient under our funding models. but. Um, otherwise, Paul. <laughs> I'm going to carry the party line on this. <laughs> so I'm going to throw just a few things that I can say uh, in this direction. There's a consciousness that um, exactly what you're saying is happening, that primary care is being avoided um, or just not accessible to um, a lot of people. In, and it does happen in rural Australia. Um, but it also happens in metropolitan uh, for different reasons. Um, so we're aware of it. Um, 
some of the things that you'll hear Minister Nash has already talked about is sort of looking at um, ways to sort of provide services, more primary healthcare services around them, or particularly in rural areas. Um, one of the driving ideas behind primary health networks and Medicare locals before them um, was to deal with that very issue, um, to make referral patterns more clear, to identify, they actually have to go through a needs assessment where they identify areas which don't have, um, which have health needs, primary health care needs, and look at ways of solving it, maybe with the local hospital network, maybe in other innovative ways. And um, the final thing I'll say around it um, is that there's a white paper around Federation out, and one of the realities of the way our health sector is con currently constructed is that we, the Commonwealth takes care of sort of primary health care, particularly GPs, um, and that's through Medicare, um, but we can't actually force them to go anywhere, or force them to do work, or force them to do types of work. Now, I think we're constitutionally disallowed from drafting them. Um, when you come to the salaried positions, well, that's a state hospital thing, uh, state uh, responsibility, and that covers hospitals, but also carries what other sort of primary health care clinics they want to use. And Northern Territory does a wonderful job of having a lot of nurse primary health care clinics in their smaller communities. Um, and that sort of difference, the fact that Commonwealth sort of provides Medicare but doesn't actually tell doctors where to go, states employ doctors, um, but normally in an acute care setting, does create a sort of um, a situation where we have to work harder to integrate a full continuum of care. And so with all of that in mind, um, these are exactly the sort of issues that are being um, discussed in the white paper. And so I'd say sort of take a look at that and have input into um, the process going forward to um, try and get to a solution where we can have one integrated healthcare system. Thank you, Paul. All right, um, one from the Department of Health and Human Services in Victoria. Just a question probably to the whole panel. But um, one thing we've observed over the last five years and I'd you'd like you, you to consider this in relation to the work that you're starting at various different angles in terms of an index of need, that we have had an 8 to 12% growth in claimants on our patient transport and accommodation assistance scheme, so rural Victorians travelling for medical specialist care. And I, I don't see that decreasing and that we need to provide safe care to those people, but in terms of looking at an index of need and how we are to look at access and equity issues, is there also going to be consideration of how we perhaps lift the burden from the individual rural consumer trying to access medical specialist care in some manner or form? Andrew, I'm sorry to do this to you, but that's really a, a policy question, isn't it, that the Rural Health Alliance might have a view on? Well, my, my thoughts there were, had anything, 82... Well, my, oh, sorry, get on the, on the mic. Oh, sorry. The 82% uh, increase, did, the, did that follow anything in particular? I'm mean, just wondering why it's gone up so, so much Eight recently. To 12. 8 to 12%. <laughs> sorry, that's much better. <laughs> First of all, each, pa each state has its own patient-assisted travel scheme, 
And as far as we're aware, Gordon, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, is that we believe that they're strongly under Funded. utilized under yeah. Under so under there's a, a lot of people who have to who, who basically go without and they will they'll either go without the 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 assistance to, to go to help or they'll go without the service because they just can't afford it. Um, so in terms of what the Commonwealth well, I, I, can, I, I can answer that. The Commonwealth will do nothing in relation to PATS because they got rid of it to the states and territories a long time ago, and there's no way they want it back. Uh, we, the Rural Health Alliance has been on this. I mean, this is a serious issue, but it's not a new phenomenon. I mean, as Andrew said, the patient assistance travel schemes have been underfunded for years. They differ from uh, state to state. In some states, the carer can get funded down and not back. In some states, they can't get funded at all. So it really is a, a, a complex issue, but this is one which the trans... Yep. So is there any connection then made between an index of need, you know, grant programs that the Commonwealth is responsible for? I, I feel I have to say <laughs> something in terms of the Commonwealth here. Um, <laughs> we do have a Rural Health Outreach Fund. I, um, that is the way we are currently thinking about getting specialists to some of the areas and prevent patient travel. Um, and I'd certainly recommend that if you've got to pick up of an area, you know, specific areas which people are travelling more, um, a discussion with the fund holder in Victoria, which I believe is the Rural Workforce Agency, Victoria R-Wave, um, have a talk with them about what you're seeing because organising specialists to go, and the right specialists to go out there, um, is certainly within their remit. Um, we also fund a number of um, telehealth items for specialist care um, and that may be another option to take a look into in terms of getting them to, um, again, if it's an area, maybe having a nursing clinic with the right facilities so they can um, use a specialist that way. And I'll say that should merge well with the Victorian system of telehealth in the hospitals. Um, and again, when you sort of start talking about the patient assistant care and the travel that they have to go through, this is again where I sort of go that there are areas that do need solutions, um, you know, different ways of approaching it. And um, when we come to the index of need, um, and will it include these sort of things, um, well, it's still an idea rather than something that I'm going to do next week. but. Um, we certainly want to make sure that we're including things like the remoteness, the population, the CIFA, um, certainly things around specialist use, although for the very reasons you're looking at, specialist use can drop off in rural areas simply because people don't bother going to, you know, going to a specialist. And then you get caught in that trap of, do they need less specialists or do they need more and they're just not using them? Um, and that sort of means that we want to take in hospital data, we hopefully want to get in some sort of outcome data from somewhere to feed it all in to say, you know, what are we actually trying to achieve? Um, and ultimately this is going to require cooperation from the state so we can see how much an individual is costing in the hospital. And so we know how much they're costing within MBS and PBS, private health insurance companies ideally, and you just start building up a sort of data set that allows us to understand better, not just sort of the conditions of the person, but also the conditions that are resulting from the health care they are getting. And that will hopefully float up things like you're talking about where um, we can identify areas which need a certain specialist because their lack of specialists are costing the system, the states in terms of travel, but also costing the individual because every Every moment of health care, every occasion of health care um, that can be avoided is a result of poor health care somewhere earlier in the track. And in many ways, the aim of sort of reducing our health spending can be equated to having better health com outcomes first time around instead of having people go back and forth. So this is sort of my personal thinking about where an index of need needs to drive to. And it is the overwhelming idea of how much data that needs to feed into it to make it an effective tool um, is a bit daunting and we need more robust, mature systems 
and we need state and Commonwealth governments to be trusting each other with that data. And I can honestly say that um, these are the sort of things that we would like to see the health department sort of being involved in with the future um, as to how long and when it's really a question of when things can be organised and when people can agree to a, what we need. That Thank you, Paul. Um, it, yeah, there's one more question, and unless, if you want to ask a question after the next one, then raise both of your hands. Is it a little one? So, okay, so we have one, f one here and then the last one here. Hey, Greg Mundy from uh, <coughs> Rural Health Workforce Australia, and it, it, it's a comment I'd like the panel to either violently disagree with me or nod, whichever you see fit. I think some of the problems that we've been talking about, or some of the issues we've been discussing about, uh, are based on the premise that you can run the whole of the resource allocation system in health on some sort of autopilot that automatically does what the spreadsheet tells you to. And I, I put that slightly flippantly because, in fact, that's never going to be the case. And for lots of the sorts of problems and issues we've been talking about, there's no substitute for the application of human intelligence to particular decisions around eligibility, suitability, and as Paul's indicated, no substitute for humans in different uh, jurisdictions talking to each other about what each other's doing and how that might best fit together on the ground. And just to take the case of the dentist, for example, I mean, we would never just allocate a dentist to a town without looking at the local knowledge about what's in that town, what's it close to, who's building something that looks suspiciously like a dental uh, surgery already, because it's that sort of information that our assessment committee needs to have in its minds when it's saying, yes, this is a goer, no, that's not a go. In terms of what they're eligible for, the rules are hard and fast. The Commonwealth says you can have so much for one, two, three, four, five, fine, that's what you get. But in terms of saying, is this person a suitable candidate for the program, not only do we apply judgment, we require them to apply judgment and say, is this business that I'm talking about viable? Give us a business plan so we can have a look. So uh, just make the point that it's not all formula driven and run by robots. Oh, nice statistician, not people, sorry, not robots. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Last one. <coughs> thank you, and just, just a question uh, flowing on from the specialists, uh, accessibility and patient transport um, discussion. Um, I think uh, workforce, workforce planning uh, could really benefit from a lot of the data that's been collected, particularly around a need index. Um, running outreach programs, we certainly see a deficit in some specialty areas as opposed to others. We have about 60 plus different types of medical specialty and allied health services, nurse, nurse services that we send around New South Wales and probably even a greater number across, across Australia. Um, you do see a variation in the uh, uh, availability of medical specialists in certain specialties, ophthalmology being one of them. Some specialties are very, very small groups of doctors. And I, my question is, how much uh, will this data be used for uh, workforce planning in some of those disciplines? How much influence does the department have and, and how much will it rely on this need index data or other data to influence the training of specialists? A lot, a lot of the shortage we see is a shortage generally, uh, which is exacerbated in rural areas. Um, but when we're recruiting for particular providers, um, it, it, it's just more difficult to recruit some than others because there, there's less availability. So how much how much, I suppose, will the department inform and act on uh, training registrars and specialists in certain disciplines where there are shortfalls based on this data? Um, again, it, this falls a little bit outside of my area because uh, specialists and the number of them affects all Australia. It's metropolitan as well as rural. Um, what I can say is that there really is a um, we have a workforce planning section uh, that fed in from HWA. Um, in many ways, HWA coming back into the department has been a good thing because it's, you know, not for the people who work there, but from a departmental side of things is that we've gotten a whole lot of analytical grunt around workforce planning issues, which is now right next to the development of policy. So um, I would be seeing that um, there are thoughts about what are, you know, basically everything, the workforce planning, but not just overall, but also in specific areas. And um, I won't trump the area by saying exactly what they're doing and when it'll be announced, but um, 
don't be surprised if you do start seeing a little more um, a little more modeling and analysis in the terms of um, our workforce supplies for medical officers actually for all um, health professionals and also something that is much more um, small area based rather than being just a national um, guess or national approach because yeah we <laughs> thank you Paul uh, allow me to make just a couple of uh, um, summative comments if I may um, surely we are encouraged not because the MM is going to do wonderful things necessarily but because it's clear from what we've heard that we have a group of public servants working on data aspects of this who clearly understand the need for good, better services in rural and remote areas. I mean, the whole of today's discussion has been infused with an understanding that there are people in rural and remote areas who are missing out. And what I heard in very many different ways from all of our speakers and from our questions indeed was a reflection that this is unjust and can be fixed. So I think I, what I want to say is that I want to thank, don't clap because I'll, I'll tell you when to clap. Uh, I want to thank Louise, Martin, Sarah, David, and Andrew, but I want to say something special about Paul Cutting. Um, the, these are good public servants. I often find it necessary when I travel to say that people who sling off at Canberra and its public servants really have got it wrong. Canberra is full of public servants who actually care, and we've heard this morning about some of the caring that these people do. It's complex. They're not going to solve all of our problems in the next six weeks or six months. But these people do care. They are working assiduously, and they understand. They have empathy. And I think this morning with Paul Cutting, we've had a wonderful example. I mean, he, he bore a load in terms of the policy questions that he was asked, which was quite uh, unjust given his position. But he, he bore it very, very uh, well and very, very willingly. So I think. I was very struck by a couple of things that Paul said. He spoke about the honing effect of uh, the, these sorts of systems of, of, of MM, uh, the honing effect on services. And he, he gave what I thought was a wonderful example. And there, there are politics, of course, associated with, with it. But he said uh, 50,000 people in aggregate, you could establish a super clinic. Let's not go to the issue of whether a super clinic is a good way to go, but it illustrates the difference between 50,000 people in aggregate, you can do one thing with bricks and mortar, you can actually have effect. Whereas 50,000 people spread over 100 places is, is quite a different challenge. And that's one of the keys which we're constantly battling in rural and remote health, is to how to find that service model which will work where the population is sparse and where we know there are shortages of health professions on many fronts. Um, so, I think, I say, uh, say again, I, I, don't clap yet. Um, I want to give a promotion of a couple of things for the Alliance. I've already mentioned our little book of numbers, and you've met the man behind it. It's this slightly mad uh, Andrew Pearson, Andrew Pearson, Andrew Phillips person here. So do have a look at our little book of numbers, because we hope it's, and we want your feedback on it. As Andrew said, it's not. It's just a start. There are holes, there are problems, there are gaps, there are all sorts of things. So let us know what you think, but let's have it grow. Uh, I want to give a promotion for a webinar which we're holding on Thursday, fortnight, no, no, never mind, fortnight tomorrow, I think, th Thursday the 17th in the morning, we're holding a webinar for one hour at which uh, three very specialized mental health experts will talk about what the recent announcement on mental health means for rural and remote areas. So that's a webinar which you can access through our website to be held on Thursday the 17th of December. And the next uh, major event we have, which I hope you're aware of, is the one about which there's a little card uh, date holder on your chair. That's Caring for Country Kids, which we're running jointly with uh, Children's Healthcare Australasia next 17th and 19th of April next year in Alice Springs. So we're still looking for uh, sponsors. We're still looking for organizations that would like to buy an exhibition booth. And we're still looking, obviously, for, well, we're starting to look for registrations. The program keynote speakers are already on the website, and before Christmas there will be a full program including all of the concurrent session papers. So keep an eye out, please, for Caring for Country Kids. But let me end by returning to you and them rather than us, the Rural Health Alliance. I am encouraged because it seems to me that if we add 
what you have got. So you represent a, a whole range of agencies which are concerned with this issue, with the issue about how we cl categorize remoteness, what it means, how we can use and misuse the system, and what it actually means for the services we deliver to people on the ground. So I sense a great, uh, a great commonality of view about the importance of this challenge, which is wonderful. So if we can join all of you, your organizations, especially the consumer groups and others, with these good people who are public servants who are toiling away in a complex area, but clearly have got in mind that same bottom line as we have got, and that is that it is unjust, unfair, unnecessary, untenable that people in remote areas should have access to poorer health services and, should have and therefore should have poorer health. So I'm encouraged, so what I ask you to do is to, is to maintain contact with these good people and to the extent that you need to. You can tell that they're very keen to hear from all of us. Uh, I encourage them to keep doing the wonderful work they're doing and I want to thank Paul very, very specially. And I want to say that the National Rural Health Alliance is kind of a bridge, if you like, between all of you and them because we have, as I said earlier, a great relationship with the national data agencies and that's of great benefit to our work. So are you ready? Now clap for them.